Next up on stage, we have for you Sally Dominguez. Sally Dominguez is a futurist, an inventor, a creative resilience ex expert, um, and also author. Help me welcome Sally Dominguez. Thank you. Whoa, here we go. There we are. Oh, missed the front one. Oh, it doesn't matter. Oh, there it is. Um, welcome, everybody. And what an awesome opportunity to collectively catapult energy thinking forward. Um, and what a joy to do it in person. So you're going to hear from a lot of people with deep expertise and boots on the ground experience. Um, I'm here, my role is to just overview the kind of mindset that we need to approach this information with the kind of mindset that suits the fourth revolution, this crazy disruptive period into which we have been thrown, courtesy of COVID-19 and the instant digitization of everything. So I want to um, I want to just overview both kind of kind of the curiosity mindset, the possibilities of this conference, and then I want to show you a couple of the things I'm working on that are in that green and circular vein, but actually are both at the point where I now collaborate with more and more people because you know you can never do this stuff on your own. As soon as we're talking about convergency, as soon as we're talking about massive impact, we're talking about co-creation. And that's why it's so exciting to be in this particular place and in the field of energy. Um, I operate across a lot of different fields, but, but energy is the backbone of everything I do. And I'm sure it's the same for all of you. It's not just an isolated vertical, it's affecting everybody. And the reason I particularly say that, I feel like I'm missing two. Oh, I've missed one. Funny. Yeah, there it is. Okay. So the reason that um, right now we're in this massive disruption is because we have hit the fourth revolution, the rise of artificial intelligence. And I'm sure you're all feeling it. You know, the other, the, the massive disruption we're feeling across the world right now is around fear and mistrust. And that comes with the kind of meltdown we're seeing courtesy of digitization. The fear in the world, unprecedented levels, is not about COVID. COVID is running a distant fourth. Fear right now, number one fear, job security. And number one generation that's feeling that, Gen Z, our future workforce. 75% of Gen Z fearing for the jobs, wondering what their future will be. And the second, Massive global fear is climate change, the impact of the increasing number of natural disasters, the frequency. And this is stuff that you're all dealing with every day. And the reason that I'm excited to be here with you is that you all have the ability to address both of those global concerns. Green jobs in the job security, climate change in the actions you're all taking every day to deliver greener, more sustainable circular energy. So, the interesting thing about the fourth revolution and kind of my specialty is the mindset we need as humans to address the rise of machine intelligence. So you would all know because part of massive part of your job is data processing, real data time feedback. You're all aware that artificial intelligence, machines can already predict, analyze, track behavior more than 30 times faster than the human brain. So where does that leave us as thinkers? If we're to leave behind that rational thinking, that analysis, and allow machines to do it better and faster, then we get to focus on what humans are uniquely built to do, and that is imagine, and to make those unexpected connections between, say, expertise and something radical you hear today that are the backbone of innovation. It's a really exciting time to be a human, and it's unfortunate that so many people in the world are afraid of jobs. And I guess it's because so many jobs have been centered on that analyst anal analysis, that kind of rational thinking. But if we approach energy with imagination, moonshot impact style thinking, we have the possibility to involve a lot of those frayed people in the fold and to achieve truly great things right now. So exciting time to be alive. Um, also a really important time to put aside any assumption that you're basing anything on or at least rethink. You know, a lot of people hear that and go, eh, I can't just rethink everything right now. I'm too busy with my day job. Fair. But it's really important as you move forward to question the, the assumptions that you're basing that motion on before you use them as your foundation. And this is one of my favorite quotes. I have it in front of my desk whenever I'm designing, or every day, in fact. 
And that is, every time you're about to take a step or strategize, consider whether you are being a pioneer of the future and check those assumptions. And so every time you're in one of the workshops, one of the keynotes or the panels over the next couple of days, when you hear something you think isn't relevant to you, I'd ask you to seize on that and ask yourself, why wouldn't it be relevant and how could it be relevant? And if you push for three to five minutes with all of your thinking power to make it relevant, you may come up with the next unexpected connection that is the next innovation in the energy game or, you know, as with so much of, of innovation right now, in an adjacent section. I mean, part of fourth revolution is about accelerated convergences. And the two, uh, the two works that I'm going to show you that I've done are all about accelerated convergences. Everything right now has the possibility of merging into something next door. So everything you hear can be totally relevant to what you're doing if you just take one step to the side. So I've popped a couple of questions. I mean, look, it's obvious, right? We already talk about the water energy nexus. Of course we do. But, you know, it was only when I started really digging into creating green hydrogen from seawater using solar that I started thinking about the resilience benefits of being able to deliver potable water wherever that energy is used. If we really start thinking about, yeah, salt water to hydrogen, I'm going to show you in a minute the little process that I've come up with for the Caribbean, but then that actually means that a fuel cell can deliver potable water in an emergency situation. I mean, we have a natural disaster, we need power, we need water. And you all in the energy game have the ability to think in terms of decentralization and deliver that kind of assistance at point. So that's why I'm so excited about the kind of technologies that are rising, is that every time we think about energy, we need to think about, is a massive mega grid, a massive scale, the solution? Or with all the exponential technologies at our disposal, with all of the amazing research that's happening at the moment, can we micro what we're thinking? Can we make a micro processing plant? Can we make a micro factory? Can we decentralize and literally physically chop up a grid and have more impact? And does that make it, us more resilient and disaster proof? And at the same time, can we invite not only our consumers, but our potential consumers and people that don't use our services to co-create proactively with us, share their digital information, share their data, become part of a bigger solution, feel involved, and that means we're leading from behind, and we're creating more hope and less fear. It's exciting, right? Everybody needs energy. And so we're in this position where we can deliver it, but we can deliver it in a way that really helps more people than ever before understand what's coming ahead and what is positive. Here's just a couple of, you know, when I talk about assumptions. So it wasn't until I started digging into storing hydrogen in the Caribbean, which was, um, I was asked by the International America's Development Bank to come up with a circular green hydrogen system for the Caribbean. I'd already kind of thought of it, so it was a kind of a, <laughs> I was excited to realize it. You know, immediately started looking at how you store hydrogen, how you handle it, and we're used to having to store it under pressure, having to build particular type of containers, but look at power paste. Now in pilot project in Germany, simply add magnesium hydride, and this thing is in a toothpaste canister. This will completely transform the use of hydrogen. It's crazy. It's just a cartridge. And so if you start thinking about that way, about so much of energy storage, not just the generation, but how we store it, or do we store it, or do we just continuously access it, right? Everything is up for grabs right now. This idea that we could actually store energy in concrete infrastructure and buildings is already being deeply researched and found to be effective in Sweden. Um, I've got all the references at the end. You'll get my slides so you can track it down if you're interested in any of this. Um, and then, of course, in agriculture, do we even need a battery? Because here's a Spanish company that is now using the soil itself to store and then regenerate drip energy that then runs its drippers and its, um, and its real-time feedback. So even when we think about storage, we need to be super open and digging for some of the research out there that's letting us do it in brand new ways. And I want to show you just a little story about this thing I did for the Caribbean. Um, they asked me to look at green energy and circularity, and I am... <laughs> because I'm a bit of a nerd, I started looking up, oh, what happens with artificial reefs in the foundations of offshore wind? Because I was thinking we should put in offshore wind, seemed like the obvious thing. They had these oil platforms off Trinidad, Tobago, 
And I thought, well, if we're going to use those platforms, let's see what else we can do to really add to the abundance of just energy. Right, so I found a guy who's the world expert in artificial reefs, and I quickly found out that if you, if you design specifically for sea life proliferation, you can, for instance, design the base of an offshore wind turbine to proliferate lobsters. So this guy told me what the architecture needs to be to make a prolific lobster ecosystem. Now, if you think about that for a second, it means you can deliver green and abundant energy, but when you think about maintaining that and having to send people offshore, if you create an abundant food source, that's also a diving opportunity, that's also a restaurant opportunity or a tourism opportunity, it's no longer a massive hassle to head out and maintain these things. You've now created a thriving ecosystem around your offshore energy generation that is just adding plus to the equation. It's creating abundance in all the adjacent areas just by thinking twice about how you build your offshore wind. This is what got me really excited. I started looking into offshore wave generation and there's really good stuff happening in that area, but I quickly realized that the low hanging fruit for the Caribbean was solar. And I was trying not to do solar because I felt like that was done and I didn't, couldn't really add to it. But you know, as I dug for the waves, I realized that you've got to start somewhere. So I'm going with solar. Of course, solar is fantastic. This, from the world's greatest innovator, is what we need to bear in mind at all times. In eras of exponential change, our reality, what we know right now, is being overtaken within the day. And so dream of what you want, dream of the impact you're looking for, and then go find the technologies. I dreamt of taking salt water and turning it into hydrogen using only solar. And I found the research at the University of Houston, go Texas, um, which was doing it really efficiently for under 40 kilowatt hours per kilogram of hydrogen. Um, so I tracked that down to the people who had licensed it, Element. They're now piloting it in San Diego, and their efficiencies are getting any, even better. But further to that, if we think about circularity, I then said, OK, we'll do this with solar. Um, by the way, it's desalination. So when we've used that energy, we get potable water, which is great in a crisis. But also, we get this brine. And let's for a second look at lithium iron. There are so many issues with lithium, the short lifespan, the non-availability, the cost. Sodium ion batteries, brilliant, cheap, and companies like Faradian are doing amazingly efficient things with them. Faradian's just been bought by a massive Indian company that's going to do even more with it. So what I proposed to them was we do local fuel cell manufacture, we create hydrogen from seawater, we take that brine, and we start exploring locally made, super cheap sodium ion batteries. Because after all, everybody should have access to this energy, not just people that can afford the most efficient solution. So I just want to put it out there that you know, when we're thinking about energy, we want to be thinking in terms of resilience. We want to be thinking about vast impact. So here's Burning Man, radical self-reliance. It's an event where you go for a week, you take your water, you take your power, you take your food, and you just thrive. right? How do we turn the world into that level of resilience? And so I'm going to share with you in my last minute another little project I worked on last year. Again, hydrogen, I'm a bit of a fan. Um, only green and not stored the way it used to be stored. So if you consider that affordable housing here, a unit costs over $400,000 to make, and that is an average from everywhere in the USA. It's crazy. At the same time, millennials and Gen Z are not likely to have a salary, particularly Gen Z. We're looking at 50% of the workforce will be gig economy. That means no security, just working like I do, like I have for 20 years. It can be stressful, people. <laughs> so. They can't necessarily pay rent. At the same time, they don't want to settle down, and they want joy. They want excitement. So I created, co-created with Quartair, this concept of a tiny home on wheels that can basically lump off like a hermit shell into little resilient nodes, so little communities that have their own energy, their own water supply. Everything is circular. This has no attachment to the main grid, so it drops in to urban renewal sites, to remote sites. And essentially, you can live out of this little hydrogen fuel cell vehicle, which has all these benefits, right? It's wider than a container house. It pops taller than anybody else because I put this exoskeleton on it. And the whole idea is that every single part of this is super innovative. The chassis is something no one's seen yet. It'll be ready by the end of the year. It's like radically cheaper than any other current vehicle chassis because of the way it's made. 
Um, it's got hydrogen fuel cell in it, but we're also exploring mycelium, so mushroom walling, recycled plastic, everything we can. Because everything you get to do right now is an opportunity to explore some of this radical technology that's at our fingertips, courtesy of the web and digitization. It's a little another little view of Rome. It's got a permanent bathroom in the, in the node system, but the truck drives in and out, and then you get to use the truck for your own goods, and the whole thing will be under 150 grand. Hopefully way less than that, actually, but you know. Got to start somewhere. So I want to leave you with this question. If we indeed have access to, and I've left out geothermal because I don't know enough to talk with confidence about geothermal, but wave energy, wind energy, solar energy is abundant, is renewable, is plentiful. So if we have access to that kind of replenished natural sustainable energy, should our focus be purely on efficiency? Or should we stop and think about earth concrete, sodium ion batteries, solid state, all of the other things that perhaps are able to deliver more green energy to more people. I want to leave you with that and this other concept, which is once you're thinking about your energy system, what else can it do? Thank you. Keep it going for Sally Dominguez. Thank you so much, Sally. And now